Welcome everyone to Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. A quick note before we start, this session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube with a link on our website, icssmarks.org, within the next few days. For over a decade and a half, our sessions were held at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library, located in Oakland, California. We now host our sessions on Zoom and have speakers and attendees from throughout the United States and throughout the world. My name is Alan Miller and I will be hosting this meeting. I'm a member of the program committee that organizes Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. And I would like to start off by saying that we always welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics and speakers. You can contact us through our website at icssmarks.org. Before we start, we wish to remind everyone that this is a comradely forum for political discourse and debate. As such, we ask that you show respect to our other participants and to the moderator of today's session. Please note that the opinions expressed are those of the speaker and participants. They do not necessarily represent those of the ICSS or the Marxist Library. However, we are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx, and we believe that his work remains relevant today. Our motto is taken from Karl Marx, <clears throat> excuse me, Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Our session today is of great local and uh, particular interest to those of us who live in the San Francisco Bay Area on a topic of national and international significance. The title of our talk today is Cal Berkeley, People's Park and Law and Order. And our speaker today is Professor Tony Platt, who is the author of 13 books dealing with issues of inequality, power, and justice in American history. His current book, The Scandal of Cal, details the crimes and transgressions that sit at the center of UC Berkeley's history. Dr. Platt is a longtime activist and is currently a distinguished affiliated scholar at Cal Berkeley Center for the study of law and society. We are gonna start with a, a short presentation by uh, Dr. Platt, followed by announcements and then uh, question and answers and comments from participants. So please join us in welcoming our guest speaker, Professor Tony Platt. Tony, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Alan. And thank you to the Marxist Library for inviting me to be in this discussion with you. Uh, I think I was here four years ago in a discussion with you about a previous book, um, Beyond These Walls, a book about the history of police and prisons in the United States. Um, this time it's a topic closer to home. It's taken me a long time to look more critically and closely at the place that I've been associated with since 1963. Came over from England as a grad student for one year to do a master's degree and then stayed on for a doctoral degree and then got a job in Chicago and then came back to a job in Berkeley uh, until they closed down the School of Criminology that I was teaching in in the mid-1970s. Uh, so what started off as a short stay ended up as a long stay, which is often the case with immigrants. Um, so uh, but when I started to think about this book and writing about this book, I uh, first of all said, well, I'm going to read everything that's been written critically about the history of the University of California. There's a lot of memoirs. There's a lot of um, individual accounts of events that people participated in. You know, the the, uh, the HUAC um, in the in the 1950s, free speech movement in the 1960s, uh, ethnic studies. There's a lot of these individual memoirs that have been written, but I was surprised to find that nothing critical had been written about the long history of the university that goes back to the 1860s. And I think it's... Um, an important topic for a variety of reasons. One is that uh, a lot of people don't know that the University of California at Berkeley was the only campus uh, of the University of California for about the first 60 years. It was uh, created in the 1860s. Uh, it opened up on the Berkeley campus in the 1870s. And it wasn't until UCLA opened up in the 1920s or later that there was actually a second uh, fully functioning uh, campus other than Cal. So um, Cal's, um, Cal or Berkeley, whatever you 
call it. It's got been, people call it different things. Cal is a bit presumptuous to, you know, use a name that stands for all the universities of, of California, which is, I think, 11 now. Um, but uh, Cal Berkeley was um, not only the first campus of the University of California for decades, but it also was a part, an important part of the brain trust of the new state. So learning about the history of the university is also a way of trying to understand how the state of California was formed and what ideas were circulating at the time and how it developed and, and who it attracted. Um, uh, the analysis in the book is probably not as Marxist econo economic that you would like it to be. Um, I'm gonna be in a discussion I think it's in June at the Bay Area Book Fair with Malcolm Harris, uh, who's written the important book on Stanford. Uh, and he takes a much more serious Marxist view of the history of Stanford. Uh, I take a more cultural left critique of the university, um, not because I'm opposed to a Marxist analysis, but because uh, I'm more into the Marxist aspects of culture and the history of culture. So it'll be interesting in the discussion with him for us to bring those two perspectives together in June. Uh, so I thought um, what I'd do uh, today is tell you a little bit briefly about how I got to how I got into this project, which and it started as a political project, not as a research or intellectual project, and then give you a brief overview of some of the findings uh, that I think are important in the book. And then uh, we could maybe take a break at that point or then i'd like to get your questions and comments about the analysis and then maybe we can come back after that and talk about where do we go from here including people's park i think people's park is a a long is, is a part of a long story but um people's park is only one aspect of what i want to be talking about today so about um 12 years ago i was up in northern california where i have a share of a a cabin at a wonderful place called Big Lagoon on the coast of Humboldt and uh, discovered there um, a friend gave me a, a report that she was working on. She's an anthropologist. And it was a report that showed that uh, on the meadow of Big Lagoon, Big Lagoon is the first of the three major lagoons up there, if you're familiar with it. Uh, there's a beautiful state park and uh, a county park. And on the meadow that the county park is uh, based in, uh, that meadow at one time, uh, my friend told me, it was an important Yurok village site for thousands of years. And uh, and that also, that was where, when, when people lived there, as, as in most parts of, of the world for most of human history, uh, people buried their dead, dead where they lived. You know, they did this for a couple of reasons. One was to protect uh, the grave sites uh, from animals and predators. And the other was to show respect to the to the ancestors. And that uh, my friend's report showed me that back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, anthropologists and amateur archeologists had come up, come there and dug up the meadow and taken out artifacts and human remains and so on. So I started working with a, a political project there, which was led by the Yurok tribe, to try to get the land preserved and commemorated. And we had some progress with that, uh, bringing in a coalition of different political actors. But in the course of uh, working with that coalition, uh, I began to ask questions about how did this happen? Who were the people that dug up these graves? And what happened to the ancestral remains that were taken out and the artifacts and so on? So that book was called Grave Matters. Uh, a new edition of it just came out uh, last year, uh, also brought out by Heyday. Heyday brought out both my books. Um, and that book uh, traced the, um, look, looked at the trade in human remains and how um, what I learned at Big Lagoon was part of a much uh, wider traffic in, in human remains and artifacts. And uh, what became more interesting to me was that I tracked the uh, archeological uh, excavations by the professionals, I traced that back to Berkeley, where uh, they were put into, um, the, into the laboratory, the anthropology laboratory, and stored there and stashed there and so on. And so 
that 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 book was about that trade and this was sort of a shock to me because i thought i knew everything about berkeley i knew something about human remains at berkeley but i didn't realize that berkeley had been so widely involved in california and elsewhere uh, in digging up human remains and amassing this uh, collection of ancestral remains i didn't realize that and i assume when the book came out uh, this was my naivete speaking still can't believe i was still so ingenuous about this but I thought that when this was publicized and the university knew about it, that they would come clean, that they would acknowledge that this happened and that they would also begin to comply with a piece of federal legislation that was passed in 1990, now 34 years ago. NAGPRA is the uh, acronym, uh, Native, American, uh, Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation uh, Act. Uh, a major piece of civil rights legislation for Native Americans in the United States um, as a way to get back artifacts and ancestors that have been taken from them. And the federal legislation um, uh, communicated with people and said that any federal, any institution that had received federal money that was uh, storing human remains and artifacts had to return them within five years. So, um, when I discovered uh, working on that previous book, Grave Matters, was that the University of California had not complied really in any way with this legislation, had just sort of ignored it. Uh, and I thought my book would make a difference, that they this would sort of snap them into action and to do the right thing and so on. But they basically ignored it. They ignored the book and they ignored the ideas in it and the proposals in it in much the same way that they ignored the protests and input of of tribal communities in California and throughout the country about what they'd done. So that was how I started to get interested in this. And the, but the book that I've just completed now, The Scandal of Cal, Land Grabs, White Supremacy and Miseducation at Berkeley, that also began as a political project. So about four or five years ago, um, I helped to co-found an organization on campus called the Truth and Justice Project. And the Truth and Justice Project uh, is composed of uh, a very small number of Native American faculty and staff, and then some students. At that time, I was teaching and working in the law school, and we recruited and trained students to, to work with us. And I was in charge of the, uh, the research for the project. The idea of the project was to find evidence and to compel the university to begin to comply uh, with this legislation of 34 years ago. That was the, the political purpose of it. But in the course of doing the research and heading up the research team to work on this, um, uh, I changed some of my views about why Berkeley had got involved in this marketing of ancestral remains and artifacts. But also I began to probe much deeper, much more deeply into a wide variety of topics and issues. Um, because I asked the question, was this treatment of Native American tribes and refusing to do the right thing by the legislation, was, was that a one-off? Was that something exceptional? Or was it something that represented something more sy systemic in the history of the university? So that was the question that I asked. And that then led to me going on a long journey, um, like a lot of um, intellectual and research work that I do, um, what makes it different than propaganda, nothing against propaganda, and I've written a lot of propaganda, but an intellectual project, I think, always has to be open to the unknown, that you're not just searching for information to confirm what you already knew, but you also have to be prepared to take journeys into things that were unexpected. So this journey was totally unexpected for me. Um, I realized how little I knew about the history of the university, even though, as I told you, I've been around Berkeley and the university since 1963. Um, I felt that I had very limited knowledge. Of course, I knew about the free speech movement and the political experiences that had, had been part of my life when I came to Berkeley. Um, and I knew a bit about the loyalty oath of the 1950s and a little bit before that, but I didn't have an understanding of the deep history of the university going back to the 1860s. Um, and uh, I, I think for a lot of my generation that came out of the new left and the activism of the 60s and 70s, uh, I think a lot of us did not have a deep historical understanding of, of previous movements and previous struggles. And uh, we were breaking away from the Communist Party. We were breaking away from 
um, nation state forms of, of communism and socialism. We were trying to figure out things in new ways, but at the same time, I think a lot of us didn't look sufficiently deeply into the history movements and what we could learn from those. So for me, this, this became not only just a journey into the history of, of the University of California and Berkeley, but it also became a, um, a dive into the history of activist movements on the Berkeley campus. But in fact, go back to the late 19th century, people were, students on campus were opposed to required military training, which took place on the Berkeley campus from the 1870s until the end of the 1950s. And quite often there were political movements to try to stop that. There were political movements to have uh, political free speech on campus that of course weren't successful until the free speech movement of the 60s. Uh, but these have long histories. And in terms of anti-war movements, the Berkeley has a long history of anti-war struggles that I, I found out about and learned about. So, um, so, this, so this project came for me both a, a much more deep understanding of the history of the University of California and the role it played in the founding of the state. But it also uh, became for me a, a reconnection with political movements that came before the movements that I've, I've been involved in. So, um, so in terms of um, a summary of, of, of what I've learned and some, some of the highlights of, of the book, um, it, it's a complicated analysis and it weaves through many different topics, but let me just give you a sense of, of some of the, of the highlights or the main points that I'm trying to make here. Um, first of all, uh, it started off as this project about human remains and artifacts and repatriating them and doing the right thing. But in the previous book, Grave Matters, I made the assumption that Berkeley had uh, had amassed this ex extraordinary collection, um, that they did that for reasons coming out of scientific racism, that they wanted to you know, study the bones and the crania and to show that um, uh, the white folks and European civilizations were superior to Native Americans and that Native Americans were sort of biologically inferior. Um, and that was certainly true for a small number of academics at Berkeley. But for the most part, what I discovered was that Berkeley did no science at all. They didn't even, they did a little bit of racist science, but for the most part, they amassed what I discovered and it was totally different from the way the university counted uh, human remains. But I, I think it ended up being between 10 and 20,000 uh, because um, it's a hard thing to deal with. But what I discovered was that when they brought human remains back to the campus, First of all, they dug up huge grave sites and they intermingled all different parts of body parts, which they then counted as one, as opposed to several uh, human remains. And secondly, as soon as they got them back to the campus, they dismembered them and put all the leg bones in one box and all the arm bones in another box and all the crania and other boxes and so on. So that um, this dismantling of human beings uh, was also done in a totally unscientific way, the very poor documentation and leaving things all over the campus and so on, not only disrespectful, but profoundly unscientific. So that led me to ask the question is if they weren't doing this for reasons of scientific investigation, albeit racist scientific investigation, why were they doing it? And when I learned that the first expeditions uh, to dig up graves took place not in California, but in the 18... 90s and early 1900s, they took place in Egypt and Peru and Mexico. And uh, when I began to study the history of archaeology uh, in the West, I realized that uh, all the major colonial states of the West that were in African countries and colonizing and so on, they also had operations to bring back uh, grave, uh, to loot graves and to bring back bodies and artifacts, bring them back to Germany and France and England and British Museum and so on. Um, and I think my analysis then shifted at Berkeley because what I think that Berkeley was involved in, and here this is a central notion of Marxism, is that Berkeley was involved in accumulation. And uh, they saw themselves as being in competition with the, the big boys of universities and muse museums around the world. And Berkeley, like California, went through this extraordinarily fast capitalist development. I mean, Marx talks about California 
probably having the fastest economic capitalist development of the world in the world. But also the University of California had an incredibly rapid development, bringing in a tremendous amount of private money uh, for its start, getting away very quickly from the idea that it was going to be an agrarian college, an agricultural college, uh, that it saw itself as competing with Harvard and Yale uh, and British universities and so on. So it was playing catch up. And uh, it managed to get Hearst money. In this case, it was Phoebe Hearst money to fund these major operations that went to Egypt and Peru and Mexico and brought back so that by 1900, they had almost a, a, a thousand human remains that had been acquired. This is before they go to business in, in California and other states as well. Um, so, so that changed my view about what Berkeley was uh, involved in. And once I began to understand its archaeological practices as accumulation, it gave me a lot of insight into how the university saw itself as an important part of the of the new state, the golden state, uh, and that it was very much uh, integrated into the capitalist development of the state itself. So um, another thing that I discovered in, in researching this early history is how tied in the university was with conquest and militarism right from the beginning. So the universities, the, the legislature authorizes the university in the 1860s. So we, we're talking about a period of history and the early history of the university that is associated with um, uh, the genocide in California of Native Americans, with the Civil War and the, and the end of the Civil War, and then with the conquest of uh, Mexico. And then not too long afterwards, uh, Pacific ambitions and occupation of the Philippines and so on. So I, 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 to me, this, this early history is not just um, settler colonialism, but this is a, a deep involvement in both justifying the conquests that have taken place and also imagining the university is leading this new imperialist state. And in fact, for those of you that know the campus or went to school there or have family members there, you probably know that the, the, the main slogan of the university is Fiat Lux. And Fiat Lux stands for let there be light, the Latin for let there be light. So this is uh, the University of California's manifest destiny. It's a notion that there was, this comes from the first book of the Old Testament, let there be light. Uh, you know, there was darkness and then God said, let there be light. So th this is the way that the Berkeley campus and the University of California thought about itself. It thought about itself as bringing light to a darkness. And that means that they had no interest in understanding the previous generations for thousands of years of populations of people that had lived here, uh, that people had lived uh, in California and throughout the state, and that had flourished for thousands of years before the genocide and before that, before the Spanish occupation and the mission system and so on. But Berkeley had no interest in, in doing that because they imagined that what they were bringing was they were bringing Europe, European civilization, they were bringing light to a place that had been dark, been darkness. And, um, you know, this is a very typical ideology of colonialism to think that, that you're bringing something to make the land grow and to be productive and that the people before you didn't know how to do that. So, um, so that became... Uh, and then when I started looking at who became the regents and who were the people that brought in all the money to the university in the early days, I quickly realized that the university was never really a public university in the sense that we think about the university, but as a university that's been governed by the regents. And in fact, in fact, the University of California today has a has a very unusual constitutional status. Uh, it, it has equal power in its origins with the legislature, with the executive branch and the judiciary. Um, it has a separate standing in the constitution. And for those of you that spend time walking on the Berkeley campus, you might've noticed that when you walk onto any entrance of the Berkeley campus on the sidewalk, just before you go into the university, there is a little brass plaque in the ground. And if you look at that brass plaque, it says, um, this, this is the property of the regents of the University of California. It doesn't say, this is the property of the people of California, or this is the property even of the legislature of California. It says this is the property of the of the regents of the University of California. Um, and then it goes on to say that uh, permission to enter this property, the property of the regents, can be revoked at any times and for any reason. 
it's it's a way then to understand I think we want to talk about it later on people's park and the whole expansion of the university trying to create a a mode of quote safety and consumption around the university which I see the uh, attack on public on people's park really being about um so the university from the early days um brought in as regents as presidents or now chancellors, they were presidents at the time, and as leading faculty, they brought in people who had fought for the Confederacy, who went on to occupy the Philippines, that supported all kinds of racist ideas that uh, uh, about uh, supported the defeat of Reconstruction after the Civil War and so on. So we're not talking about some fringe members of the university. We're talking about um, one or two faculty members that became uh, presidents of the university. We're talking about leading academics who were given honors on the campus. And then we're talking about buildings and monuments on campus named after people that supported the Confederacy, uh, fought against the Union, supported white supremacy and so on. So this was built in to the original governing body of the university. And it was built in also to the landscape of the university, the architecture of the university, and also into, into the way that the buildings are named and who's honored on the university. Um, so that to me became a, um, an important insight and one that I, I, then of course, you begin to see the connection between that and the way that tribes and native people were treated by the university. I think the militarism and the occupation uh, helps to understand that relationship with with native people. Um, so, uh, and then uh, the other thing that becomes an important part of the book is that many of the intellectuals at the university, many of the faculty members, were very involved in writing the history of California. And they wrote a history of California that some of you may have been exposed to if you went to school as a as a child in California, or if you have children or grandchildren that go to school here. But it was a history that also emphasized how uh, California and the United States was bringing light and civilization to the wilderness. It's very much in that framework. And these were these academics um, didn't just write serious texts, which they did, but they also wrote texts and stories and magazine articles for a popular culture. They also brought journalists on campus and gave interviews and so on. So this notion of um, California bringing civilization to the wilderness and the people who lived here before being of an inferior civilization or a lesser people, that becomes very embedded in the in the textbooks and in the, the libraries and the literature that millions of students, young people have been exposed to. And often still when I get people in campus and I ask them, what did you learn when you were in school in California? They still talk about how they, the missions were taught to them in the schools as um, as places of bringing Christianity to the the un, to the uncivilized and the savages and so on. And that, um, they talk about remember going to visit missions and having and walking over the you know the bodies of the dead without even knowing they were doing that. Uh, or they talk about never being taught about the genocide in California in the wake of the gold rush and so on. So. Um, I wouldn't say that this is more damaging than the digging up of ancestors and ancestral remains, but I think it's as damaging. That is because it does damages to people's ideas and beliefs, and it has an enduring, it leaves an enduring mark on the campus that people really think that there was nothing before, or there was less than us before, or that people that lived here before were uncivilized and so on. So the final thing that I think becomes a, a central component of the research and the arguments in the book is, um, um, first of all, learning about the long history of native resistance in California. There's a tendency when we read the history of, um, of indigenous peoples in the United States, there's a lot of emphasis in different parts of the United States on battles that took place, you know, fierce resistance and so on. But as I look through the history of all the literature that taught the history of California, that very often native people in California were presented as being passive and not having any sense of resistance to what happens. And in fact, a textbook that came out in the 1940s that was quite popular said that uh, native people who lived here, you know, were so backward and so uncivilized that they didn't even realize they were being conquered. Um, so this kind of literature is pervasive and um, it's reminiscent to me that there was a short period after World War II 
when people began to write and talk about the Holocaust. And there was a, a literature that came out and a way of framing things that talked about uh, Jews and the Holocaust sort of going, going to their death like sheep, you know, in the concentration camps. For a short while, that was the period. That was the, the way of thinking about at that early stage of, of, of understanding the Holocaust uh, and that people had not fought back. And in fact, there was great shame for many people who survived the Holocaust, great shame attached to them for, for not being seen as people that fought back and resisted. That ended, you know, a few years afterwards. So now we have an extraordinary rich and varied history of the different ways that that Jews and other groups in Nazi Germany fought back and, and uh, resisted and uh, in all kinds of ways and so on. So that's gone. But I, but I think for a moment there, uh, there was that notion of, of Jews being sort of passive, passively going to their death. And definitely that persisted in California about Native Americans. So one of the things that I do in the book is go back through the long history of resistance and write about that history. So for example, a, a rancheria in California, Northern California in the 1900s, hired a very high powered law, law firm to file a suit against the University of California for digging up the graves of their ancestors. And they won that suit. So, I mean, most people are not familiar with the fact of, of the, the fact that there was these legal struggles that took place about repatriation and about uh, plundering of graves and so on. But in general, when you read the textbooks and the memoirs and the stories that I did for this chapter that I wrote, uh, you realize that uh, there's no sense of resistance there. And when you when you describe people as not resisting, then in a sense, they are seen as collaborators with their own defeats. You know, if people don't resist, then no wonder that bad things happen to them. So um, I think coming to terms with how that idea was developed and how deeply embedded it became in the literature of the history of California and, and undoing that uh, is, is an important part of the book. Of the book. And when you, um, when you look, at that his look at that history and that resistance, it is a lot about land, is because land was taken... Uh, Land. They were not only was the genocide, but there was dispossession of of native lands that had been here for thousands of years and village sites, and so recovery of land and recovery of ancestors are two of the key aspects of the struggle uh, of native struggles in California, and that's why it was so important in the legislature that Congress passed in 1990. So I talk about four different ways, and I'll do this very briefly, but there's four different ways that um, give you examples of how Berkeley and the University of California is implicated in dispossession of land. So first of all is the Morrill Act of the 1860s. Um, this was land passed by Congress and, imp and implemented by President Lincoln, where lands, public lands were seized and the argument was made that these lands were unused or they were abandoned lands and so on. But for the most part, these were lands that native people had been driven out of as a result of, of war and genocide. So it's the federal government basically taking over dispossessed lands. And then they took those lands and they gave them to different legislatures around the country, California being one, and said, you can use these lands for startup money for your universities. So Berkeley got a lot of land that was in the Central Valley um, from, that had been dispossessed from tribes, and that land, that land was very valuable. So the university sold some of that land, they rented some of that land, uh, they invested in that land, and so on. And so, for the first decades of the University of California, the income from those lands played an important part in setting up the university and allowing it very quickly to develop into becoming a major university in the United States and also recognized in other parts of the world. So the Morrill Act is the first example of, um, of that. And I, you know, the University of California at Berkeley doesn't have much in the way of soulful public art, but there was one piece of art on the campus. The, um, the, um, there's a, a, there's a, a, a bust of Abraham Lincoln that I've always walked past. And I always sort of appreciated that because he, he looks sort of soulful. The, the rain and the water has, makes him look like he's, you know, there's tears there. You can imagine that. And uh, I was always appreciated that and thought that it had been put there because the university wanted to honor him um, for his role in, in, in the abolition of slavery. But it turns out when I did research that the not only had the the bus been done by somebody who was a big fan of the Ku Klux Klan, but the bus was put up there to thank uh, Abraham Lincoln 
for providing these lands for the university in the 1860s. So that's one example of land. The second example of land is that the University of California at Berkeley is, is on uh, Ohlone land. I know now we do land acknowledgements and we sort of have these sort of generic statements that people make about, you know, we're on lands that were that Ohlone people lived on and so on. But in my research, I was able to identify the exact places on campus where they lived, where they buried their dead, and then began to learn a lot more about the history of the prehistory of the university. And uh, if you remember those huge rains, we had huge rains this year, but there were huge rains about two years ago. Uh, and I went on campus that day, this is a photograph in the book, and took a photograph of Strawberry Canyon, which runs all the way from the hills of California down to the estuary at the bottom of University Avenue in Berkeley. And uh, there, when I, that day when I went there to visit and take the photographs, you get a sense of how, what an enormous waterway this was. So you had fresh water running all the way from the hills down to the end of Berkeley. You had uh, plenty of trees and oaks for, uh, for housing and for, for, for boats. Uh, you had uh, all kinds of game in the hills of, of, of Berkeley that could be hunted and so on. So it turns out that the Berkeley campus is not just the site of an Ohlone, important Ohlone uh, village site, but the whole area really, where you follow the Strawberry Canyon all the way from the top to the bottom, and you're going to have signs of, of um, important settlements there. And probably you've just read recently that uh, the city of Berkeley is now going to be giving back this part of 4th Street uh, that was definitely a settlement, but all along 4th Street, that whole area, you're talking about you know, tens, tens of settlements in different parts of the East Bay. Um, and that these these were flourishing settlements because, you know, when people have enough food to eat and they have easy to access shelter and they can, um, uh, they can create a comfortable material life, uh, when they can do that as they did around here, then they have a great deal of time left over for cultural and ceremonial life. So it's widely believed now that this wasn't just a, uh, an economic settlement, but was an important cultural settlement. And when I dug into the Berkeley records and found actual records of in this within the university's archives, uh, I was then able to sh show that the university knew this and knew about it, and uh, uh, and but, but kept it pretty quiet and didn't publicize it and didn't want any information getting out. So right from the beginning, it's not only been an important settlement, but Berkeley has known that. And you could go around the Berkeley campus today and there's no signage that tells you about that kind of history. So that would be a second example. The third example, which um, I had not really investigated or thought about before, was that uh, the University of California, including very important scientists from Berkeley, Oppenheimer, uh, and Lawrence and others, um, that they uh, not only uh, developed the blueprint for the atomic bomb at Berkeley, but then we're very active in, at uh, Los Alamos in actually developing the bomb. And uh, some Berkeley scientists, including uh, Oppenheimer, were, uh, were very active in actually selecting the sites where the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and then Nagasaki two days later. So what I didn't know until I researched this was that the University of California and the federal government co-manage uh, not only the lab uh, where the bombs were developed, but also Los Alamos, the whole land land that was taken over for the families and staff of the laboratory, a huge amount of land, and a great deal of that land had been historically important burial sites for indigenous peoples in New Mexico. Uh, and then, of course, you know, with the, the, the testing of the bomb and the development of it and so on, the, it, then the, the local rivers just became saturated with toxicity that affected uh, not just native native people in, in New Mexico, but also possibly thousands of other people too. So there's a long history of that. And then in addition to that, the University of California uh, and Los Alamos Laboratory, uh, they set up and co-manage a museum that some of you may have visited in Los Alamos. And the museum is basically a propaganda museum for the for the US military, justifying the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's no oppositional arguments there and so on. And uh, the University of California co-manages and administers that museum, a museum that basically is not a, is a museum only in name only. It's basically just a, 
a mouth a mouthpiece to tell history from the viewpoint of the U.S. military. So that's the third example. And the fourth example, um, which is a part of research that I'm doing now, is that Berkeley took over a whole section of land in Richmond, um, land that at one time was the Ford Motor Company, uh, land that at one time was um, an important ammunition factory in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, land that was once an important uh, chemical plant for Stauffer, uh, uh, and other industrial plants there, uh, land that was then, um, you know, made into an industrial plants. And now if you walk along the Bay Trail, you'll see that you can get to housing developments, new middle-class housing developments that are there and so on. But uh, that land that Berkeley occupied in the 20th century had also been a very significant Ohlone uh, uh, land. And there, there's probably like 14 shell mounds of which only two still exist on the island in the bay there, which is restricted in terms of people being able to go there. But Berkeley anthropologists and archaeologists came in there, dug up um, the shell mounds, took human remains and artifacts away, and then the whole land was leveled uh, and turned into uh, different kinds of uh, plants and industrial operations and so on. Um, so this is the, the the latest thing that I've I've discovered. And if you go there too, the, or if you look at the information that Berkeley puts out about what is now its Richmond uh, field campus um, about itself and its history, there's no mention there too of its indigenous origins, its indigenous history. People probably lived there four or five thousand years. It's now thought. And these were very significant uh, fishing sites, uh, particularly mussels, but other other operations that went on there. There were small manufacturing that the Ohlone engaged in, and so on. It was a very flourishing part of the of the long history of the Bay Area, a history that the University of California now tries to uh, uh, obliterate and erase. So, so for me, land uh, becomes a critical issue, and and the way um, of dealing with this history in this past has to take land centrally as a major part of it in the same way that East Coast universities are now uh, slowly beginning to deal with the legacies of the slave trade and their involvement in the, in the slave trade and how they got their money from the slave trade. I think the Berkeley equivalent is that Berkeley and the University of California got its start from land and the occupation of land and the selling of land and the taking of land. And so for any kind of reparations or justice to be done, I think land has to play a critical role in that. So that's a lot of information. Some of you may know a lot of it or a little bit. Some of this may be new to you, but I thought before getting into where do we go from here, we might want to have something of a discussion about what I've just talked about. Thank you, Tony. Would you mind maybe just for a few minutes uh, speaking in particular about the People's Park issue? Because I think it ties very much into the land question. And I think it'll stimulate a lot of questions and discussion. Would you mind covering that a bit? Sure, I will. So um, we had a teaching on People's Park. I don't know if any of you were there. Uh, and um, I was one of the speakers. It was, it was a very good event about two weeks ago. And if you're in any way tied into the information going out about from organizers of, of trying to protect People's Park, uh, that's now available, I think, on YouTube, that whole session. Uh, uh, people spoke about the history, student activists spoke, people gave um, information about what that area used to be, what People's Park used to be, and so on. And uh, I think it's a very useful, I think it's very useful educationally. But um, so I, the way I, I try to understand People's Park is that Again, uh, th through issues of land. And if you go back through the history of the University of California, going back to that um, that plaque I told you about, that's all the entrances saying that this is the property of the Regents of the University of California, is that the Regents have, um, they really have the ability to um, take land through uh, legally justified eminent domain. They have eminent domain rights. So if they can make a case that they need land for research or classrooms uh, or laboratories or for housing for students um, or for resources for the university and so on, usually they're able to do that. They have that, they have that legal and political right to do that and they enforce it. And I've always thought of, um, because I came here in 63, that that area of 
of Berkeley, the South Side area, and some of you may have been here then or may remember it, that was an extraordinarily vital area of the university. It was, rents were cheap. Uh, there were a lot of political activists that lived there, artists that lived there, um, that there were all kinds of events and social and cultural events that took place. It was the countercultural opposition to the university, and particularly because the university, until 19... 63, 64, 65, until, you know, they changed the rules about free speech on campus. Uh, Southside, in a sense, became the, ex the, the expansion of the university for free political speech and rallies and organizing and so on. And for those of you that remember the anti-war demonstrations that took place and the battles with the cops and the sheriffs and so on, a lot of that took place in Southside in that area. So in some ways, um, People's Park, I think, is the last vestige of that uh, cultural social movement to create spaces that would be counter to the way the university corporatizes public space. I mean, if you go down Telegraph Avenue now, uh, uh, I think Moe's is probably the last bookstore of its kind surviving. Amazing that it's still surviving and still there. But... Um, you walk down and you walk down a corridor that is built in, is built to provide different kinds of consumption for young people. I mean, that's fine. Young people need restaurants and places to go and cannabis stores and uh, clothing stores and record stores and all of that. But if you if you go through there and look for anything that is, uh, you know, non-profit or alternative or countercultural, for me, I think MOAS is the last vestige of that. So one way that I understand the university's policies around People's Park is to, to create this moat of um, of protection and safety, um, and also uh, to create a uh, all but leaving in place all the ways in which young people with money, in particular, consume what they what they want close to the campus, in terms of food and entertainment and so on. Um, so so that that's that's one way to think about that, and to also um, to think about um, people's part there not just being, you know, a place for people to have as a, a, a as a green space, as an alternative space, a, a space for events and so on, but as a space that is the is a vestige of what was that culturally, politically important space right next to the campus. The other thing that the university has done around People's Park has uh, brought back the rhetoric of the 70s and 80s, uh, law and order and the war on crime which has now become um, a major feature of political campaigns uh, tied to immigration, tied to the homeless population and so on, uh, very reminiscent of, uh, of previous campaigns with the Democrats, you know, making sure that they're not outmaneuvered by the Republicans in terms of talking about the need for crime control and so on. And here it's a bit, um, it's a bit like a conversation with Trump. It's not like you can have a rational conversation you know, violent crime has gone down. Homeless people in general do not engage in crime. Um, that uh, the university does not talk publicly about all the crime that takes place on the Berkeley campus. It's as though the Berkeley campus is made up of angels. You know, there's no people, there's nobody stealing money. There are no rapes. There are no assaults. There are no fights that get ha out of hand where people get hurt and injured. Uh, there's no sexual, there's no sexual rapes and assaults and so on. Um, You'd almost think that um, the, the campus is is totally law abiding and peaceful. So it's um, when I look closely at the history of the way the university portrays People's Park now, they portray it as crime ridden, um, and in the same way that you know blackness of often that the crime often becomes a substitute for talking about blackness or African Americans. You know, we want safe places, we want safe communities and so on, as opposed to saying we used to, you know, we want to drive black people out of this place. And in a way, the, uh, the, the rhetoric about crime, I think, has become a way to talk about the disrepute of people that, uh, that, that, are, that are without homes and so on, that are on the street, even to the point of, of now eliminating that little uh, station of information that they had in the middle of uh, Telegraph before it expands into into the road um, uh, beyond beyond the the strip there, and they're also doing their best to try to close down the chess games that are taking place on People's Park. So I see those as all interconnected. And but what's what I, what struck me is how the university engages in massive 
propaganda to parents and to students about making Berkeley into a safe place. And, you know, when I talk to students that come from Detroit and Chicago and New York and major cities, and, you know, I say, do you think that Berkeley is a dangerous place to live in and so on? They start laughing because compared to, you know, the crime rates that they've been used to and growing up with, they find Berkeley to be very law abiding. So I don't want to take away the fact that, that, there is an increase in certain kinds of crime, but crimes of violence uh, have actually gone down in the Berkeley area and the Bay area. The murder rate's gone down. There's very little murder that takes place in the East Bay at all, even in places like Richmond. Um, but the university has cherry picked that information and then sent it out particularly to parents. And I've gone around with the official tours of the campus and the official tours of the campus that are mostly parents, you know, dragging their teenage kids around the Berkeley campus. If you've never done that you should do that because you get their take on the history of the university but they also talk about how safe the university is and you can send your children here so they won't have to deal with homeless people and so on and the final thing i'd say is i also went back to re-look at a book uh, a colleague of mine susan schweik that some of you may know she just retired from berkeley unfortunately um uh, she wrote a very important book called the ugly laws and in that book, she showed how in the late 19th and early 20th century, that uh, major cities passed legislation, uh, informally called the ugly laws, that would make it illegal for people with physical disabilities to beg in the streets of the cities. Um, and because on the grounds that they would upset, you know, law abiding people who were walking around and so on. And so when I see the current campaigns against the homeless, I'm very much reminded of those early 20th century efforts to uh, make sure that um, law-abiding folks didn't have to be upset and worried because they saw people who were in bad shape on the streets. So anyway, that's there's lots of other ways to think about people's part, but that's what struck me about it right now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, what we're gonna do now is take a short break for announcements followed by questions, answers, and comments uh, from participants. So if you, those of you who have questions for Tony, please uh, take a look at the lower right hand part of your screen, the reactions button, raise your hand. We'll try to get to everybody uh, as, uh, as fast as we can. Uh, also ask your patience. And um, lots of issues here, other issues that you can also ask uh, Tony about and talk to him about. He has a long, rich history of uh, involvement with the university and the, the struggles, uh, the mass movement here at uh, Berkeley. Um, I just want a, a couple of quick reminders. We have a few, we have a couple of very interesting uh, programs coming up. On March 24th, we're going to have a program on neoliberalism, the new class correlation. The speaker is going to be Basudev Chowdhury from People's Brigade in India. He'll be speaking to us from India and a very interesting grassroots uh, working class movement in opposition to uh, what's going on in India, the, the attacks on the working class and uh, the uh, Modi regime in India. And he'll be giving us kind of a ground level view of what's, what's going on there. I urge you to come on um, March 24th. And then on April 7th, we're gonna have a return uh, by Ann Garrison, who is um, uh, with the Black Agenda Report and also I think has done some work with KPFA here in Berkeley. She's going to be speaking on the 30th, uh, 30th anniversary of the um, Rwandan genocide. She'll be speaking about uh, what, what happened then and what's going on in Africa today. Um, I do want to call your attention to the fact that if you wish to contact us, you can go to our website, icssmarks.org. We have a contact form. Uh, we also have our past uh, programs up there and links to the YouTube videos, recordings of many of those programs. The website right now is down. First time, I think, ever. It's It's gone down. We have a technical uh, issue, but it will be back up uh, shortly. So please come to our website and uh, contact us if you wish. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, 
start taking questions. I just would like to mention uh, from a uh, from a personal perspective that one of the pieces of history that Tony didn't mention is that um, he was a professor in the School of Criminology at UC Berkeley in the early 1970s during the sort of towards the end of the anti-war movement. And um, he was fired by the university because he was taking a uh, he was presenting criminology from the point of view of the crimes of capitalism and imperialism, and it sparked uh, major demonstrations on campus. An occupation of uh, Havland Hall on campus was really a uh, quite a mass struggle that took place uh, in defense of his work at the university. And um, another reason why we're so glad to have him uh, speaking today. So I'm going to start with uh, Gene. And again, those of you who have questions, please um, uh, click the reactions button and raise your hand. And uh, Gene, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Um, okay, I believe I am un unmuted. And you are. This, I hope. Okay, well, well, Tony, thanks so much for your, your talk. I, I have, you know, I uh, really appreciate it. I have to say that. Um, you know, I first enrolled at UC Berkeley in 1954 um, when it was uh, tuition free. It was, uh, the fees were, I think, $40 a semester, um, just raised from $37.50. And, um, you know, both my parents had gone to Berkeley uh, and uh, I was born, you know, in Concord, which is just on the other side of the Berkeley Hills. So uh, I, I, yeah, and I'm a lifetime member of the Alumni Association, and we all really appreciate uh, uh, Berkeley. And uh, I, I just want to mention that, but I also have to say that your your description is very realistic and very true. And um, a couple of things. One one of the things that grabs me, I guess, is sort of tangential. Is is I've been interested in NAGPRA for a long time, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, and I, I taught for thirty years at Cal State Long Beach, and the entire campus is built on the remains of not just an Indian village, but the most sacred creation center of the California Indians, known as Pavunga. And we had a very long struggle there, uh, led by the Indians. Uh, but uh, as w one of the unique things about that is the Indians won. They won their lawsuit. That land is protected. And they have uh, regular ceremonies every year uh, in uh, memory of Pavunga and the Native people. And it's a big powwow on the uh, Long Beach campus. So I just wanted to, to mention that. But again, um, I may have some other things to say, but again, I really appreciate what you said, but the other side of it is I'm a strong supporter. I mean, I have to look at the positive things that uh, the university has done in terms of educating people. Uh, you know, per personally, I'm very uh, thankful of that. So I just wanted to mention those things, but again, thanks so much for your talk. I really appreciate it and may have more to say later. Thanks. Go ahead, I just say something quickly, respond. or do you, or do you, do you want yeah, to take two? Actually, what we like to, what we like to do is one question at a time, so they don't get lost okay. in the discussion. Uh, so go ahead. Oh, thank you, thank you for your comments, Gene, and uh, also reminding us all about uh, Long Beach and, and that struggle that happened there. And uh, you know, the NACPRA start struggle that you're interested in is, I mean, people are all over the country. Uh, Native organizations and tribes have been pushing hard on this and pushing on California, and, and California is now beginning to slowly, slowly respond to that. Um, in terms of what you said about your relationship with 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 Cal and Berkeley, and uh, I don't think your hat is a Cal hat, though, is it? Your cap? No, it's Veterans for Peace. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you're like me. You're, you're ambivalent. You're not. You're not wearing the 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 Cal cap there. Uh -huh. um, as so, a matter of fact, I don't have one, but uh, oh. so you know, a friend of mine um, uh, at a having a discussion with a panel about the book, and he said, you know, and he knows me very well. He says, he says, I think Tony has a love hate relationship with Berkeley, and uh, that struck me because you know, Berkeley has been. I came here; I was twenty one years old, uh, and 
uh, it was extraordinary to come from England and I came from Oxford, which had been run like a sort of a medieval placed university, you know, where you, you had to dress a certain way and you couldn't oppose things at all. So coming to Berkeley was so liberating for me in 63 and then 64, this free speech and so on. Um, and that a lot of my key political uh, identity and developments has happened at Berkeley in the criminology school that you talked about, uh, in political movements and political activism. I mean, I came with a sort of a, a progressive political worldview, but my term, time at Berkeley gave me a long, a lifetime commitment to activism and being on the left and so on. Um, and so that happened at this place that I'm now doing the critique of, you know, but I, I always come back to, uh, you know, what T.S. Eliot, this is a paraphrase of T.S. Eliot of like coming back to the place, coming back to the place I've been to many times before. I'm just beginning to know it for the first time. It's, I mean, he said it more eloquently than that, but, uh, and I think there's still a lot to know about Berkeley, but it, yeah, my, my, my sense of wanting it to be a different place also comes out of the sense that it can be that. And my political history at the university and my connection with the history of political movements at Berkeley uh, give me the sense that that's a possibility. It, it's a difficult, a very difficult journey. Um, but I think what's problematic also is that Berkeley has built its reputation globally. Whenever I go to other countries and say I'm from Berkeley, people, oh, you're from that radical university. You know, it's such a radical place. And uh, it's the woke campus. And and even the right wing goes after Berkeley for being such the, you know, the woke campus, which it's doing right now, you know. Um, so Berkeley's played a big role, the University of California too, in promoting that mythology about itself, of being the radical university of, um, you know, if you read its history now, it almost it almost appears like that the university supported free speech as opposed to fighting it for 75 years and stopping it from happening on the campus. So the fact that Berkeley co-ops that, um, that rhetoric of being a public university when it's been so in, entangled with private interests and private money and being a woke politically radical movement when it's done everything possible to repress every radical movement on campus, um, I think uh, gives me more urgency. And, but it also gives me an opportunity to say to Berkeley, which I'm doing now, to say, OK, this is your aspiration to be the progressive campus, to be a public campus. Now you have to live up to that. Thank you. OK. Okay, um, Mario had his hand up. I think is he uh, Mario? Are you still on, or um, did he get uh, he dropped off? I don't see him. Okay, so uh, Margo, if you would uh, go ahead, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. I I remember I was on campus with you in the nineteen seventies, and I was always very impressed with your work at that time. What I wanted to ask you, I don't hear any mention of Krober and all the anthropologists by name that went around digging up things. And um, I think they're renaming some of the buildings in that regard. But the thing that really gets me right now is I felt like the end of the university came in my mind when they uh, installed a vice president of real estate you know, as part of their administration. And, and since then, the, the, I mean, the relationship with the city of Berkeley right now and the People's Park and all of that is so appalling. And the, what you're describing on, on top of that is, is just as amazing that I never heard any of that when I was a student there. Thank you. Tony, do you have a comment? You can unmute yourself. I'm just trying to, I'm, I just unmute. Thank you, Margo, for those mm -hmm. comments. And um, nice to see you again. <laughs> what 60 years later or something um so um yeah i didn't talk about Kroger because um i mean i could i have a lot of stuff about Kroger in the book Kroger was the lead anthropologist at berkeley he was um there in the 1900s he became chair of the department in 1909 1910 and he was there for the next uh, 45 or, until um uh, until about 45 46 so uh, he, he was a key member of the Berkeley faculty, and he's a complicated person. In fact, there's a new book that's come out about a, by a colleague on campus that defends Krober and so on. He did some very important work. But um, 
And, and I see him in the book, I see him as a very contradictory character, but as the chair of the Department of Anthropology, which was, at that time was a very powerful department on campus. Uh, Phoebe Hurst was a very active in anthropology and she was also a regent and brought a tremendous amount of money from her, uh, but her husband left her into the campus. And so um, she played a big role in making anthropology and archeology span very important. Uh, and, and Berkeley had a lot of resources to try to play catch up with Harvard and British Museum and so on. Um, but um, I, I, in this book, I tried to understand Prober's role, not so much as an anthropologist, but also as the chair of a department of a powerful department where he allowed, he allowed these different tendencies to coexist. You know, a eugenics part of anthropology, the amassing of human remains of artifacts allowed to happen. And then he did his stuff on languages and trying to preserve languages and cultural work and so on. So um, he, I, I think of him now as very much a shapeshifter, you know, depending on whether he had to operate inside the system of power or outside of it. But um, I, I think he has a lot of responsibility for oversighting a department that amassed 10 to 20,000 uh, ancestral remains and hundreds of thousands of cultural artifacts, which tend not to be given enough attention on, in terms of the publicity about Berkeley. Um, I see this comparable to the campaign that is still going on for the descendants of, of Jewish and other families from Germany who had artwork taken away from them by the Nazis and in the aftermath of World War II, um, that I see this comparable because so much of what Berkeley amassed was either plundered or it was bought at you know, dirt low prices from people in California that were basically starving and needed money for food and for medicine and healthcare and so on. People who were recovering from the from the genocide. Uh, Berkeley took advantage of that and um, hundreds of thousands of artifacts were collected in that way. Very important baskets and ceremonial material and so on. So uh, Prober was the guy who was in, he was in charge of the department that did that. And so I think he has that responsibility. The university has removed his name from the building as it has from five other buildings. Um, it's not done anything for the last year. And the problem with the so-called unnaming committee is that you have to take initiative, you have to do research on the person, you have to collect uh, signatures on it, you have to write a research report, and then you have to submit it to the university. And then the university considers it and makes the decision and sends it up through the, the hierarchy to, to unname something. So it's a lot of work to make this happen. The committee that's set up to deal with this does not take any initiative, nor did they look at the interconnection between different names. Uh, so yes, Krober is gone. Uh, LeCant has gone from the, the building where the atomic bomb was, uh, was actually first thought about. Um, LeCant has gone from there because he was a, a white supremacist. On the other hand, there's a plaque uh, in honor of LeCant in another part of the campus that's still there. So it, it's it's done in a very uneven way. And the committee doesn't look at the interrelationship between all these different names and buildings and how this was created. And most significantly, they've not yet gone after the Hearst name. And we have what? Hearst Tennis Courts, Hearst Avenue, Hearst Parking Lot, the Hearst Greek Theater, the Hearst Museum. I mean, it's... Hearst is everywhere on campus, and it, without the Hearst fortune from George Hearst, who supported the Federacy, who voted against the an ending of slavery, um, who left a fortune to Phoebe Hearst, then put it into the university, and also attracted other supporters of white supremacy. Um, th this, this committee and the people on campus have not yet gone after dealing with the legacies of the Hearst family. Okay, next is uh, Bonnie, followed by Janet. So, Bonnie, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, now? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, I just want to mention that um, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive, and I put a note about this in the chat, if you want to read it, is raising funds to install a memorial plaque to Robert Merriman, who was one of the 2,800 or so American volunteers who went to Spain in the 1930s to fight against fascism. And he was a student at UC Berkeley. And so they're raising money to install a plaque there. And all the information about it is 
in the um, December 2023 issue of The Volunteer, which is both online and in paper format. Um, but you can go to Alba's website, which is www.alba-valb.org and read the articles and details uh, about this. Thank you. Do you have any other information, Bonnie, about about? No, the no. Everything is in the. Oh, okay. uh, if you go okay. to the website, you'll get all the all the details. Okay. okay. And so you can donate comments. there also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Hopefully. So I, I'm really glad to hear about that. I didn't know about that. I'm putting up my two um, email addresses. I really like to hear from anybody that has follow up from this discussion. Things that are going on. I noticed somebody put something up about Richmond. I'm just now doing research on Richmond and the Rich Richmond site. Uh, I'd really like uh, to be in touch with that person or get information. So I'm putting it up there for anybody that wants to be in contact with me, and I'll I'll certainly get back to you. Uh, Tony, is your email berkeley.ed or edu? It would have to be edu. They all are. I would believe so, yeah. It's okay. a typo if they didn't have yeah. it. Okay. Um, next is uh, Janet. If you would unmute, please, Janet. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tony, for your presentation. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, and uh, I, I would like to just bring up the uh, archives in Israel uh, that uh, were put together uh, from art artifacts from the, the Nakba, the original Nakba in uh, 48, where all kinds of ob objects of Palestinians were stolen and uh, they, they are in these archives. Um, and uh, of course, there's the genocide going on in Gaza and this destruction of uh, education uh, uh, places and and objects um so i i wanted to ask you about um um ishi ishi uh whether you could maybe talk about him and uh he he was supposedly the last remaining wild Indian in California, and I think, well, he just walked out in, uh, from the wild and was, I, I'm not sure if taken by force or, but um, uh, he uh, was kept uh, and, and observed uh, for many, many years. Um, I think at, at maybe UC Berkeley or UCSF, um, Anyway, I thought I'd ask about that. A living, uh, a, a living person. Thank you, thank you, Janet. Uh, thanks for the information about the Nakba in Israel and so on. Um, yes, I'm currently um, trying to bring out a woman, a Palestinian professor at um, uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who's just been suspended, a senior professor with a long record of mm. fantastic intellectual work and activist work. She's just been su suspended for um, speaking out against genocide. So we're trying to bring her to uh, San Francisco uh, later in the year, probably in November. Um, it's, a, it's an important case because this is the first example of a university professor in Israel being um, removed from a position uh, for expressing a political view. And uh, there's a big worry that this is going to go deeper into other campuses too. Uh, it's easy to find out about this case. It's getting quite a bit of publicity now. Uh, issues a long story. Um, and uh, But maybe you could do a thumbs up if you remember either reading the issue story or your children or grandchildren read the issue story. It's, um, it, it, I mean, it, when Krober died, his... Um, his widow wrote a book about the issue story that became one of the most popular books in California history. I mean, it sold over a million copies. It's still selling, you know. Um, 
So Ishi that wasn't his real name because Ishi is just a, a tribal name for like a person or or, or a man, and uh, he wouldn't give his name. But um, uh, yes, he 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 was in bad shape. He was he was not doing well, and he was um, um, he was found. He was put in a jail in one of the rural counties of California, and people came to stare at him. Hundreds of people came to stare at him, and then Berkeley sort of adopted him. Uh, very much, in, if you're not familiar with it, in the tradition of the human zoo, uh, human zoos uh, bringing, uh, you know, Aboriginal people, strange-looking people, uh, bringing them to world fairs to uh, uh, as entertainment and so on. That was very, very popular in Europe uh, and also in the United States uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And um, Ishii, I think, was very much in that tradition because they put him up in... Um, in the early 20th century for a few years before he got tuberculosis and died, um, he, they put him up in a, in a big house up on Parnassus Avenue in San Francisco, which uh, the Berkeley campus had taken over to exhibit its artifacts. And uh, he lived there. And then every weekend they would have like a public event and people would come and stare at him and he would do some, some crafts and skills and so on. And, uh, a huge amount of publicity about him. The university got a, a great deal uh, off his exposure and exhibiting him sort of as an entertainment. And then um, when he died, they um, they took out his brain and sent it to the Smithsonian. I mean, it's just, it's just a horror story, but it's one that made Berkeley very popular. And then when they actually moved the museum from San Francisco onto the Berkeley campus and set it up, they'd have exhibits about Ishii and so on. And today there is a, uh, a place on the campus named uh, named Ishii, though there's no information there about him. And I stood there asking students, well, who is Ishii? What's this about? And, you know, some people would guess and say, oh, is he, is he an, a Japanese philanthropist? I mean, people had no idea, you know, didn't find one student that knew who he was. Um, and it's it's important that that was set up. And there was a big fight, I understand, to get the uh, the place on campus named after him inside a building in the uh, in the interior of a building. But today, most people have no idea because there's no information there about who he was. And the whole mythology about the last surviving Indian was just part of the mythology that people, you know, lapped up as a popular story. And um, it's pretty heartbreaking, but it had a profound impact on um, uh, on students that read this all over the place as young people. And it sort of is a romantic story and it's a... And it's a, a positive story in some ways, saying what a wonderful person he was. So it's not like they talk about him being uh, inhuman or lacking humanity. But it's sort of the romance of Ishii. Um, and then, and by that, people think, oh, it's great that he was saved from being starving, and he was great that he was looked after in this place in San Francisco by the Berkeley anthropologists and so on. It's it's quite a tragedy, I think. Okay, next is uh, Raj, if you would unmute, followed by David. Raj, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Tony. Uh, thanks for your talk. I I learned something here that I didn't know, which was the degree to which um, uh, uh, racist uh, past of the UC Berkeley and its regions owning the play. I knew about it and its involvement with... Uh, Nuclear weaponry is well known. Um, so the picture that emerges uh, from your talk is comprehensively, this was the cutting edge of uh, American dominance of the world after Second World War, uh, and it's going on for a long time. So thank you for that. Uh, one question, mine is kind of a different question. Uh, I came here to visit before I left for India. I thought I would this was going back to India for good, but it turns out I did return. Uh, so I came to visit 71. There was a lot of drug peddling going on around the campus. And, uh, uh, um, and, and it seemed to me, those uh, later on I read that this drug were not just a, a, a innocent thing that happened or some people got into drugs. It was pushed by American intelligence agencies and was brought in here to basically destroy the radical movement. Can you, if you know something about it, I'd like to know um, from your research if you ran into that. Thank you. 
Okay, put on my criminology hat here. Um, I, I don't. Um, I don't think that um, intelligence agencies were involved in pushing drugs into activist communities to get them to go crazy or depoliticize them and so on. There's very good evidence that intelligence agencies have always been involved in doing business with cartels and organizations that trade in, and trade in drugs if they think those cartels can be important in fighting against regimes that they want to fight against. I mean, that's definitely documented and I totally support that. But um, no, I think the drug use on the Berkeley campus came and elsewhere was organic and uh, mostly marijuana, though at that time, uh, not heavy duty drugs. So also uh, when I was there, you begin to see the experimentation with LSD and other kinds of hallucinogenics that are now sort of becoming kind of mainstream. You know, people are going to, uh, organized events to use hallucinogenics and other drugs to try to deal with psychological issues and so on. Um, but um, and it, when you go back over Ronald Reagan's speeches when he was governor of California and had his eye on going to the White House, he used sex, drugs, and rock and roll at Berkeley as one of the main themes that he talked about um, and emphasized you know, the drug crisis at Berkeley and wild sex on the campus. Unfortunately, when I was a grad student, I missed all of this. I don't know why I missed it or how I missed it, but I did. Um, and um, so, so that association of Berkeley with drug, drugs was um, part of the political language, but I've never, um, I've, I've never found evidence about the point that you were raising. Okay, next is uh, David, if you, David Campbell, if you would unmute yourself and um, go ahead. Greetings, thank you, Alan and Tony for your presentation. Um, one um, comment observation and then two possible questions. Uh, the, you may have mentioned it, but um, in Emeryville at the uh, Bay Street Mall, there's uh, Shell Mound Street and Ohlone Way opposite the Sonesta Hotel and there's a nice tribute to Shell Mound history, to that local specific Shell Mound history, um, and there's a little bit of a kind of a river creekside walkabout, a diorama that you walk through. It's not enough, but it's something not nothing. I thought I would mention that if if you had not. Um, and the other is um, two questions. One is on campus at Sproul um, Hall there, right in front of the I guess it's the administration building. There's an oval with um, with a sentence in the round that reads something like this land and the airspace extending above it shall uh, not be subject to any nation or the law or the or any any uh, entity's jurisdiction. I was wondering if you've seen that and, and know that short history. Um, the other question, is um, maybe ultimately the more important one. I could probably figure the other piece out, but I, um, I'm of Scottish uh, heritage, among others, of course, Irish and Norwegian and, and some of the rest. Um, ninth generation, I've, I've been over to Europe several times and Scotland in particular. And it, it strikes me when I'm there in the, in the aisles there, um, Scotland in particular, of course, the whole land is is rife with history, and you see it in much of the historical rendering. But I've never been aware of any sort of a acknowledgement. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something you've seen or seen done as part of meetings or conferences, that sort of a thing. I've never seen anyone stand up and say or remind this is the land of the Angles and the Britons and the uh, and the Picts and the Gales and the Norse and the Celts and the Romans. Of course, as I say, it's all in and throughout history, but have you seen that? Would that be relevant or um, to any sort of uh, commentary or discussion? Thank you again very much. You're actually muted, Tony. Uh -oh. You're still muted. You can actually leave yourself unmuted. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very familiar with the shell mounds at Emeryville and the struggle that's gone on there. Uh, yeah, so it's it's better to have some documentation there and memorial 
than nothing. I mean, Berkeley campus so far has nothing. Um, and people are not reminded in any way unless they go to look for it on the Berkeley campus or already knowledgeable. Um, so that's good. Um, and I think uh, that campaign on 4th Street at Berkeley is now successful and very important. And hopefully this will be a, a model for the University of California to now return land. Uh, the University of California owns nearly 9,000 pieces of property and land. And so it's one of the big landowners in, in California. And uh, uh, in the same way that they could find land for student housing and didn't have to take away people's park, they could also find land for reburial. So, because most of the Bay Area tribes uh, whose, whose graves and village sites were plundered uh, are not federally recognized and are fighting for federal recognition and therefore don't have land and don't have resources. And without land and resources, it's very hard to repatriate and rebury and go through all the ceremonies and detoxify, you know, things that have been kept in chemicals. I mean, it's it's not, repatriation is a very hard road, even if you, even if, if Cal wants to do it, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I'm glad you found the curious thing about, uh, have other people seen that curious little circle on the Berkeley and Sproul Plaza there? Anyway, I I do write about it in here. I, I write about Sproul Plaza. Um, so uh, activists who've worked ar around um, keeping the spirit of free speech movement alive and having commemorations and having events and so on. Um, quite a while ago, they wanted to have a commemoration of the free speech movement. They wanted it in Sproul Plaza because that's so associated with the movement and the speeches and the sit-ins and so on. Um, I mean, years later, um, I also write about him. A, a somebody wanted to give money for the free speech movement to the campus, and gave a lot of money for the cafe that's now in the uh, in the ground floor of the library on campus, that's called the Free Speech Cafe. But would only give that money on condition that the cafe commemorated the free speech movement, and the university agreed to that. But they didn't agree to having the free speech movement commemorated in Sproul Plaza in the way that people wanted. A memorial to be. I mean, normally you have a, the name of who you're commemorating or what you're commemorating, and then you have a little description about it. But all so there's nothing there that mentions the free speech movement. There's no historical context. There's this, this very strange quote about all the land above it here, this tiny little circle in the middle of Sprout Plaza. Everything here is free, you know. And uh, I stood there and interviewed people as they walked past and I didn't find one person that was clueless. I found several people that um, that guessed, you know, they thought this had to do with uh, indigenous rights or, or they, they just guessed, but I didn't find one person walking by that had any idea that this was connected with the free speech movement. So the memorial violates the basic rule of a memorial by like telling people what this is for or who it's for. Um, and then if you search, as, as I did on the steps of Sproul Plaza, where Mario Savio and other people gave speeches, you'll see a little plaque there to Mario Savio. Um, and it has his name on it. And I think it has the, the dates of his birth and death. Uh, it doesn't say what he did or why his name is there. And again, students today have no idea who Mario Savio was. Uh, and underneath they have a quote about free speech not from Mario Savio, who gave many speeches and had a lot to say about free speech, but this is a, a quote from a, a, a Greek philosopher of uh, classical Greece. So, I mean, these are examples where even when they try to do something that approximates a memorial, that it's sort of useless as a memorial. And then over to the side, for those of you that know the Berkeley Spell Plaza on the campus or have been there many times, there is a fountain. and. Uh, you can do thumbs up if you know who the fountain is named after. Hmm. Nobody knows that, huh? Oh, Ludwig. Alan. It's Ludwig. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Alan, do you want? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I remember Ludwig. <laughs> uh, do you want to say, Alan, who uh, was named after? No, no. He he said. I think uh, David did. Okay. Go ahead. So yes. It's it's named. It's not only named after a dog that used to hang out when I was a grad yeah. student at Berkeley yeah. around the fountain. It's named after him. But there's a plaque there, and the plaque is signed by the Regents of the University of California, <laughs> acknowledging the role, the important role that this dog played on the campus, and and uh, giving him sort of permanent respect at the fountain there. So, 
I'm all for dogs. I have a wonderful dog. I totally believe in defending the rights and namings of dogs, but it's 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 just set up so perfectly that you have all this information about the dog and you have no information about the free speech movement or Mario Sabio. Um, and just finally, in terms of a place to Scotland, um, I mean, I've been to Scotland, but I haven't, and I was at a conference there recently by Zoom on commemoration and memory. And there were a lot of examples of things going on there now. Um, I don't I don't think they have a land acknowledgement that they do in the same way that we do, but there's a lot of work going on on the history and particularly the role of Scotland in, uh, in, in imperialism, in British imperialism, in, in India and other places. And uh, there were interesting reports at this conference about that going on there. The place in terms of, if you want to see memorials that make it impossible for you to be there without knowing something about the deep and horrendous history is Berlin. I mean, you can't walk around Berlin without seeing memorials, statements, texts, explanations, uh, sculptures and so on everywhere. Um, it, it, it's, it's unavoidable. Uh, some very small and, and somewhat innocuous and some grand and huge. But um, but meanwhile, Berkeley has nothing. Uh, Sharon, if you would unmute, please. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, Tony, can I ask you to put on your criminal justice hat for again for a minute? Um, I have a question about um, criminal justice reform and the university. So um, I, I, I think of the university as an arm of the state. So I, I would, I'm just wondering to what extent uh, progressive forces or Marxists have made any inroads there around criminal justice. I know that um, Chesa Bodine landed there in the School of Law and he now has a very important um, um, place to, to speak from, but we are on the defensive, those of us who have around the country elected progressive, that is to say people who, uh, district attorneys who um, are working on reforming criminal justice, getting rid of the mass incarceration and the school to prison pipeline. And I'm, I'm just, we, I feel, I feel like we're really been on the defensive. They went after Pamela Price in Alameda County before she was even took office. Yeah. And um, what, what do you think about that whole, the whole question of, criminal justice reform, and in particular, the role of the university. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you raised that. Thank you, Sharon. It's, it's an important, important issue. Um, so first of all, about the university. So the university, um, I went to, I went to grad school, and then I went to Chicago for a postdoc. And then I came back as an assistant professor in the School of Criminology at Berkeley. Uh, in uh, in 68, I was there until I lost my job in the mid 70s. But that school of criminology was the largest and oldest criminology program in the country. And um, often the university says, well, you know, we had to get rid of it because it wasn't meeting our professional goals and also because it would sort of be taken over by the radicals. But in fact, it was a very pluralistic place. You know, you had um, a small group of radical professors and, and students. Uh, you had a sizable number of social democratic liberals who were, you know, working with the war on poverty and working with uh, what they saw as the extension of the New Deal to try to bring democracy uh, to the country and were uh, supporting all kinds of reforms around criminal justice. And then you had uh, people who'd been professionals at prisons and police departments and who were very conservative and so on. And you even had people who were in the criminalistics program, you know, looking at fingerprints and all of that. So it was very lively and very argumentative, but it, it's, I, I think a university should be lively and argumentative. I mean, one of the things that horrifies me about what's going on on the campus now is that we've had no public intellectual Ed educational debates on campus about what's going on in Gaza and Israel. There've been no public forums on that. I mean, the campus has all kinds of people that are so well informed about these issues. And uh, we have all kinds of policies about, you know, concerns about 
students' feelings and needs and making sure that free speech is allowed and so on. But you would think a university would be a place that would encourage debate and argument and would educate people about these issues. But there's not been anything. I don't think there's been anything since uh, like this since 1964 when I went to the convocation at the Greek theater and they dragged Mario Savio off the stage when they were discussing the free speech movement. Um, so for me, that school of criminology was extraordinary, not just because I had a place to, and, and, and colleagues and comrades to work with and do the work that I did, but also because it was so lively and argumentative and 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 uh, and loud at times. And in some ways it's it's my my idea of what a university should be if it lived up to its uh, its aspirations. So um, one of the things that happened when I was when I lost my I lost tenure at the job, but I the ACLU took my case, so we got access to all the internal records. And there was one very interesting letter that the chancellor at the time wrote to the committee considering me for tenure, and he said, you know, Platt has very bad relationships with the police departments, and uh, the university needs to have good relations with the police departments and. Uh, and basically, if he's not around, maybe we can keep better relations with police departments. And he put that explicitly into a, a letter that he sent, then sent to the committee. I think he thought the committee would be confidential, which it was until my lawyers were able to get access to it. And then uh, uh, this was after I wrote the book, but I, I came across a statement that, that Beale, who at one time was the chief of police on the Berkeley campus in the early 1970s, uh, he was being interviewed about crime on campus and so on. And he said, we don't have any problems with crime on campus. All our problems on crime come from outside the campus. That view that the area around the campus, that was the South Campus, what becomes People's Park and so on, is that that's where all the crime is and so on. And I was struck then how this view of what crime is and what it's not has been very much a part of how the university operates. Um, you know, the university just appointed a new police chief on campus and she came from being the head of the police at uh, uh, at the House of, of Congress in D.C. She was the head of the Congressional Police in D.C. So it's interesting that the campus police thinks it has to bring somebody from uh, dealing with, you know, public, um, the aftermath of the, the storming of, of Congress and huge demonstrations on, 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 at, at, in D.C. around Congress and so on to bring somebody who did that job to to look after the, to, to be in charge of the Berkeley campus. Um, so in terms of generally, I, I it's good to see Chase of Boudin. I'm, I'm at the law school. I'm in a, the Center for the Study of Law and Society at the law school. And it's good to see that he's been brought in. It's going to be the head of a, a criminal justice and justice center there. And that we now have a, a center on indigenous law and justice. All, all this is good to create these openings, to have these discussions and so on. And uh, I hosted I hosted Chase Boudin at an event to talk about his experience in San Francisco and reform and so on. And uh, part of the conversation we had with him is how how come it's taken so long in this country to pass even the most modest criminal justice reform? So there was a a, a man who taught at the Berkeley Law School in the 1950s and 1960s. I knew him then in the 60s, Caleb Foote who was one of the first law professors to talk about bail reform. And he made the case that bail is uh, a class prejudice. If you don't have money, you wait in jail, which are just horrific to be in jail while you're waiting to go to trial. You can spend months or years in jail waiting for that. And then you get railroaded through the system. And he called for bail reform in the late 50s. And then the Vera Foundation took that up in, in, uh, in New York in the, in the 60s and 70s. And people are still fighting for that, and he's still fighting for that. So one of our discussions was, how come it's been so difficult to get the most modest reforms through? And then you have, you know, the Black Lives Movement that is probably, if not the, certainly one of the most important mass movements for justice in this country that's ever happened. And it's extraordinary how it mobilized people all over the country, not just in the communities that that the, the, the police operated in, but in, in much wider uh, political circles and had an incredible impact on public debates about crime and law and policing and so on. It's like a public education about policing. Very hard to sustain that, very hard to sustain mass protests on the street without organizations that can take up those struggles and make them happen in a permanent way. Very hard to do with that when you don't have national organizations. Very hard when the Democratic Party is also very involved in fighting back, maybe 
putting out some rhetoric of support, but eventually going back to law and order as it's doing now. Um, and when you have Democrat mayors and people running for office in the Democratic Party that are now saying we need to bring back law and order, even though there's no evidence about an increase of the crime rate in the last couple of years and so on. So um, it's very difficult. And it speaks to the larger difficulty of creating alternative left socialist political movements in the United States that have staying power. Where compared to Europe, we have no comparable organizations that have done that. We've had movements, we've had organizations, we've had communist parties, socialist parties, mass movements and so on. But sustaining that in, in a um, over a long period of time is very difficult. And I think the resistance to making any kind of moderate reforms around jails and police and courts and so on suggests how important the police and criminal justice is to maintaining institutions of, of inequality in this country. In a way, I think about the criminal justice system as being our equivalent of a decent welfare system. We don't have a decent welfare system. Instead, we have cops and jails and prisons that perform the work of what they think welfare should be, which is sort of a social control operation. So um, I think it just raises the larger question of having many more discussions now about how to create organizations and struggles that represent the majority of people, that don't organizations that don't internally produce problems of racism and sexism and that or don't become sectarian. Uh, I mean that's the challenge in a and I think the the best hope for this globally right now for me comes from the ecological movement and the environmental movements that sort of I see that as the the beginning of new global movements for social justice. But um in the United States, we have a long way to go. Okay, next is uh, Richard. If you would unmute, please, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for somebody that doesn't know anything about Berkeley. But, uh, um, so my question is this, is, is you were you in Berkeley um, back in the 60s, back in the heyday, the so-called heyday of student activism, uh, and you're in Bar Berkeley now, is, is my understanding. Um, could you compare, um, you know, uh, the student activism back then to what's going on now? I mean, I as sort of following up on what you just what you just said. Uh, if you could compare the, I mean, you mentioned the ecological, um, you know, and um, um, anyways, if you could compare the the level of of, of Student activism and, and I guess political uh, political consciousness. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is an important question. Yes, so I know Berkeley pretty well. I've been here except for two years when I went to Chicago for a postdoc. I've been uh, in and around Berkeley. I came here as a grad student. I came back as an assistant professor. I lost my job as assistant professor. I stayed living here, you know, family, children here the schools here. Um, was lucky to get a job after I lost my job at Berkeley at, in Sacramento at a state college. Uh, very lucky because it was hard for me to get a job because of, of blacklisting for people like me around the country. I was thinking about going back to England, then got a job at Sacramento and stayed living in Berkeley, commuted from Berkeley, um, had children here, growing up here. Um, and then uh, after I left Berkeley, I... Um, I went and taught for a short while, a few seminars and working with the Department of Social Justice in, in San Jose. And then um, just was very lucky to be in a conversation with uh, Jonathan Miller, who was a, a Jonathan, there's a, a word slip here. Some of you might remember Jonathan Miller, who was the um, uh, important comedian and satirist, um, came from England. Uh, Jonathan Simon, a, a law professor, uh, wanted me to give him feedback on a, a book he was writing on the history of California prisons. And I sent him, a, I didn't know him very well, but I sent him a very um, strong critique of the chapter. And then he said, let's get together and talk about it, which is very unusual for senior Berkeley professors to take criticism and want to talk about it. And so we got together and talked about it. And then we came up with the idea of teaching a class in the law school uh, in which we would talk about the history of prisons and police and crime from a, a sort of a radical versus liberal perspective. Uh, and he put together the best of his ideas and I put together the best of my ideas. I brought some of my students from San Jose where I was teaching a seminar at the time. 
and it became this in really interesting event um, uh, where we and we, we also tried to do it in a very generous way so we we would listen to each other and respond to each other and you know by the end of the course we realized we had more in common than we had differences but um but out of that he then invited me to come back because at that time he was the director of the center for the study of law and society at berkeley he invited me to come back and be sort of an honorary fellow of this of the university where i've been doing research and occasionally teaching courses since then um about eight eight nine years ago um so that's allowed me to come back on the campus. I'm giving you that long biography just to show you how deeply knowledgeable I am about Berkeley. But it wasn't until I got into this book and the, the deep history of the book that I I really became much more familiar with the history that I didn't know. So, um, and it's, I, I've been thinking about that. Why people who become faculty at Berkeley study everything in the world except where we work and, and, our, and, and our place that we spend all of this time. And, you know, it's one of the axioms of, of left and political movements that you're supposed to know the place where you work and where you study and where you're active. Um, you have a responsibility to do that. So it struck me that Berkeley academics, and there's some extraordinary people that have taught here and leftists and uh, academics that, have, that are known all over the world, but the, the resistance to um, biting the hand that pulls you up the ladder uh, is the way that I think about it. That Berkeley is a very privileged place to be and that once you get to this place in your career, you're sort of at the top and then you can go from here, you can go higher to Harvard or Stanford or Berkeley likes to think of itself as equal to Stanford. But, you know, you to be at Berkeley, I the things that I say at Berkeley now and the things that I write about are the same as the things that I say when I was at Sac State at San Jose, but the ideas are taken much more seriously by journalists and I get invited to give talks and go places, get invited to come to you and talk to you and so on. Being at Berkeley, you know, does have this cachet and this um, uh, this status that goes with it, even though I say exactly the same things I've always said before. So, uh, and, and I think this this conservatism the, at the top of the university, you have the regents that have enormous power that represent some of the most powerful people uh, in the state, and that always have. And from the beginning, they were uh, they were the part of the robber barons of, of California. It's been a very powerful governing body. And then below that, you have a president of all the campuses that is trying to keep the regents above him, uh, you know, happy with what's going on and not have any scandals or not have any big issues, not have huge demonstrations going on around Casa because then the, the, the regents get involved and they want to make sure that they, they can stop this kind of thing happening. And then uh, the, the word goes down to the chances that, you know, let's keep the campus under control. Um, Let's make sure that uh, so Berkeley, for example, has uh, has a whole set of rules and regulation regulations about the place and time uh, and uh, where you, and, and, and space where you can hold demonstrations. It tells us where we can demonstrate and when we can demonstrate and how we can demonstrate. Now, you know, the point of a demonstration is that you don't observe the rules, you know, but they have rules about that and they can they can discipline you or throw you off campus if you break those rules and so on. So then it comes down to the faculty and the faculty then sends down uh, these messages by by keeping away from issues that would upset the people above them. That's my view now, having realized that hardly anybody on campus writes critically. And then there are people, and I'm glad to hear that there's going to be a, you know, a memorial to the, um, the person on campus and that you're raising money for that. That's important to do that. Anything Anything like this that we can do is important to get people to stop when they walking around the campus to see things and to and to be educated about that 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 is is that i think is 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 very very important um so it, it's a curious thing to be in a place that talks about itself as a leading public university and a leading progressive university that makes sure that the both of these things are sort of bottled up inside the university and that in a way all of us that get to be at berkeley then play our part in going along with this and so and if you break that rule and go against it as as I and others and students and faculty did at Berkeley in the School of Criminology, they get rid of the whole program. And then it's not just about our careers and the students and the staff that work there and so on. It sends a message to the rest of the campus. It says, look, this is the oldest, most important School of Criminology in the country, but you cross this line and we will just close the whole program down. We'll get rid of three educational programs, three degree programs from a doctorate to an undergraduate, and um, we'll move the 
remaining professors that we who are tenured and that we trust into the law school where they are now and set up a, a different kind of program there um, and that we'll do that and that and people get that message you know uh, other departments and other faculty members get that message that the university can be a very ruthless place and we saw that with people's part i mean they bring in hundreds and hundreds of cops totally unneeded <laughs> Um, I mean, in the old days, you could have said there was going to be a battle on the street around People's Park, but not now. I mean, to bring in hundreds of police and to put them up for two or three days and to feed them and to pay for them and to have helicopters above and then to get these giant containers and to bring in a company that would put the containers there and then to hire 12 security guards, 24 hours, three shifts of security guards. I mean, all of this is, is a message to people that you better stay in place. Okay, last uh, question uh, from Janet, then we're gonna wrap up at uh, 1230. So Janet, if you would please uh, ask your question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so this is kind of a follow-up uh, on some of the things you were talking about, the regents of California. Um, and I, you talked about the regents own certain things, um, not uh, the university system. I mean, I'm basically somewhat confused about that. And, you know, like, how are the regions organized? Are they, I, it's my understanding that they're, a, a corp they've incorporated themselves. Um, so it's a, a corporation registered with the California uh, Secretary of State. Um, so they own uh, the People's Park or some 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 property, some entities, and the they being the regents are is it as a, a group? Is uh, if somebody is a regent, do they personally own some uh, or have a stake in mm -hmm. or like that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm. Uh no, I'm, I'm glad you raised this again, uh, John. I mean, yeah, it's a complicated, it's a complicated legal, political, historical issue. But um, yes, the regents are incorporated, but they were incorporated. Um, the university was founded in the 1860s, but in the late 1870s, the um, the legislature voted after a big struggle and many arguments to basically give the University of California independent status in the Constitution of California. So it's in the Constitution incorporated in the constitution and set up the rules for how people get to be on the board of regents. So they consist of, they're appointed by the governor. They include the um, leading political offices of the state of California, and then they're appointed for a term by the governor himself. Um, so if you go back and you can easily find the lists of the, of the regents of California, you go back to the, in the earliest days, um, these were the, the brains trusts. These were the economic founders of the new state of California. These were people that had fought in the uh, colonial battles to establish California as part of the United States. These are people who had fought in, in the war against Mexico or led the war against Mexico. These were people that had their eye on uh, China and the Far East and the Pacific right from the beginning. So uh, California, you know, people talk about California being a settler state, a colonial settler state. It was, but for a very short period of time, because, of, you know, you think of settler states being uh, individual settlers, you know, taking over land and having their own land and so on. But uh, California becomes corporatized at a very, um, very, very quickly. It's one of the fastest growing collective developments of capitalism in the world. And uh, once uh, agriculture gets uh, uh, industrialized, once gold mining gets industrialized, once the railroad is built and so on, California becomes a, a world economic power very, very quickly. So the, the original regents were a part of this vision of California. Not the, the original idea for the agrarian colleges under the Morrill Act was that they would support agriculture. And certainly the University of California supported the industrialization of agriculture, but it also supported a much a larger uh, vision of what California would become. So that those are the regents. And if you look at the regents today, there's been some appointments of people to represent, you know, students and other groups. And the first um, Native American uh, regent has just been appointed from California, first time ever. Uh, 
so there there is some some diversity there but uh but it's a very it's a very powerful institution and it does it nobody uh, they don't own this personally it's not like this is their personal wealth but the original regents were understood the importance of the collective wealth of california they had that kind of vision they were visionary capitalists they they weren't they they aggrandized themselves individually but but collectively they were much more interested in seeing the potential for for California to become an extraordinary capitalist state, which it did. I mean, unlike many other places where you've had extraction and colonial settlism and so on, but California taking all this wealth and then putting it back into the state and developing new wealth and so on is very extraordinary. So they come out of that history and they have that responsibility. And literally that plaque at the entrance to all the campuses gives them, uh, the university regents collectively own the buildings the land. Um, if you somebody was surprised by Berkeley having a real estate department, but we also have a brand uh, brand protection department. That the brand Berkeley is a brand, as well as a economic investment. Um, so in many ways, it operates like a corporation, and that's why when the protests come up or people complain about things like I do and so on, they manage it like a corporation. How to minimize the problem how to respond, how to co-opt, how to ignore, uh, all of those techniques that the way the university handles its, its image in the world is it comes from political think tanks and it comes from corporate think tanks. Um, so I don't know if that helped you understand that, but it's it's not personal. It's and What makes it so powerful is that it's a collective body and it has a collective vision of the state and it's a collective vision that's very much at odds with the way I would want to envision a university. Who does it report to? It reports to itself. <laughs> the meetings are public. Okay. You can go to the meetings. And also, you know, when people ask me, like, how much land does Berkeley own? And the, all the research I did for this book, all that information is available and public. You have to dig around. You have to find, make friends with librarians who tell you how to find stuff and so on. But, for example, I was able to find a list of all the property that the University of California owns and when they when they bought that property and how they got that property and how big that property is and so on. So in that sense, they're a public institution um, and all the documentation, internal documentation is public. They have to hold their meetings in public as well. Thank you very much, Tony, for uh, participating for your presentation, for the excellent uh, Q&A session. I wanna thank all the participants today Really great questions, good good session. Uh, remind you to come back next week to hear the discussion on the uh, people's movement, the working class people's movement in um, uh, India. Also, you can, uh, Tony's promoting his book. It sounds really interesting. Definitely wanna take a read on that. So that's available, I guess, through the publisher and uh, bookshops and Amazon and quite a few different places. And yeah, uh, I look I, forward to, go ahead, go ahead, Tony. You know, Moe's and Books Incorporated and Powell's okay. if you get your books from Oregon, but good to support those book bookstores and it, also, always available for heyday, but we also like to support the, the bookstores. Okay. And um, thank you very much. We're, we're gonna certainly welcome you back for your next book and the next topic that you're gonna be uh, presenting on. Um, with that, I think we'll cut the recording, Raj, and um, okay. and we'll see everybody next Sunday morning at the Marxist Library on Zoom. So, so go to our website when it comes back up and sign up for our email notification list. And again, thank you, Tony, for uh, coming today and doing <music>
Please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com and the name is Richard Fallenbaum and checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F A L L E N B A U M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml info for information write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org